Summer of Politics, revisiting the July national conventions and the issues fueling the presidential campaigns. High Court misses an unresolved religious freedom case leaves some pharmacists in legal limbo. Remembering World Youth Day, fired up young Catholics take Pope Francis's message of mercy to the world. And reaching for the gold, more than 500 American athletes represent the USA in Rio. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly Summer Special for Friday, August 12th, 2016. Good evening, thank you for joining us for our EWTN News Nightly Summer Special. I'm Brian Patrick. These past few months have been packed with politics, terrorism, and international papal travels. Tonight, we're gonna to look back at the top stories we've covered in this summer of 2016. The presidential campaigns have picked up intensity as the November election nears. The Republican Party met in Cleveland in mid-July, officially nominating Donald Trump. A week later, in Philadelphia, Democrats declared Hillary Clinton their candidate, the first female to win the nomination of a major political party. Our political team followed the action, first in Cleveland, then in Philadelphia, at the Republican National Convention, former candidate Dr. Ben Carson made headlines. He called the transgender issue the height of absurdity. Our chief White House correspondent and political director, Lauren Ashburn, asked Carson what he meant by that. People wake up one day and they say, they're, they're a man, and they say, you know, today I feel like a woman. And uh, <laughs> there was a story about a man, it was in Ross, he was in the Ross uh, store, in the women's dressing room and a woman came in and she was disturbed and she went and told the manager and the manager came to expel him but then came back out and said well he says even though you know he had a five o'clock shadow and he was dressed that he feels like a woman today so I mean we have to let him and that's why it doesn't make sense to you is it because of your faith because of your religion no, no it's because of my brain <laughs> <laughs> it's because I asked for that you know for for thousands of years we've known what a man is and we've known what a woman is all of a sudden we don't know anymore can you imagine the confusion that this causes our children genetics tell us who's a man and, a and woman. who's a woman going forward we're about to wrap up the convention we'll be wrapping up the convention what do you think your role will be? You have been a great advocate for education in this country and the need to improve it. Do mm -hmm. you hope to have some sort of role in the administration? Uh, I would prefer to work from outside the administration like I have been doing for years. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, there's so many issues that I've gotten involved in. Health care, uh, education, uh, you know, terrorism. I mean, just about everything now. I don't really want to pigeonhole myself. Dr. Ben Carson with Lauren Ashburn at the Republican National Convention. Republicans focused on national security as the threat from ISIS grows. In June, a gunman claiming allegiance to ISIS killed 49 people at an Orlando nightclub. It was the deadliest mass shooting in modern U.S. history. The day after the attack, Orlando Bishop John Noonan told us how the diocese is reaching out to survivors and the families of victims. Your Excellency, your community has been shattered by this tragedy. Our prayers are with you. And as shepherd of this diocese, what is your message to all of us from around the world who are seeing this now? Well, first of all, I thank all the people who have sent us prayers and condolences. You know, it's really a heartwarming effect to have so many people call you from all over the world. It is really, a, you know, it has wrenched our whole community. It's a heartfelt, you know, moment where we're really just, we're in shock. I think that's the only thing I can tell you right now. And what is the diocese doing in terms of outreach to the people in Orlando? Well, I must say our priests, our deacons, and our Catholic charities have kind of gone out to all the victims and their families and, and helping with whatever way we can. We're adding any kind of resources, especially because a number of these victims are Spanish speaking. So we're reaching out to them with some of our bilingual faculty and staff and priests and deacons to just show and care for them at this moment, which is such a shock to them. I'm sure that you've heard this before, Your Excellency. Why would God allow such suffering? Is there any answer that you could give? I don't have an answer for the pain and suffering, you know. I, I just prayed as I was coming back this morning on the plane. I thought about Christ even. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, we, we're all feeling that pain. 
and again in the scriptures you know jesus wept at the sight of lazarus his friend there are many moments in our lives when we feel pain and sorrow we question god's role in all this but i think ultimately we only trust in god you know it's it's not our ways but god's ways that you know and it's god's mercy that we're, we're really truly entrusting our lives to at this moment and tell us about the vigil to dry tears that you have planned there well, you know, the first thing we, we did was to care for the people. Now we need to pray with them and to reassure them that God is with us at this time. And it's only with faith and hope and love. And as Pope Francis tells us, unless we accompany our people in their moments of pain and, and suffering, that we truly can bring Christ to them. And hopefully during these next few weeks and months and maybe years ahead, that we can at least help them heal from this tragic loss of life. Bishop John Noonan joining us by Skype from Orlando. Your Excellency, thank you so much. Thank you. Bishop Noonan joining us uh, in mid-June for that discussion. The Supreme Court refused to hear a major religious freedom case this summer. Some pharmacists claim the state of Washington is forcing them to prescribe the morning after pill that violates their faith. Jason Calvi profiled a Christian businessman who hoped the high court would take up the case. Greg Stormans and family run Ralph's, a grocery store and pharmacy founded by his grandfather in Olympia, Washington. We will sell every, every life-saving drug, every life-healing drug, but we will not sell any drug which ends a life or, or results in, uh, in an abortion. He refuses to sell morning-after pills. The FDA-approved labeling says Plan B may stop a fertilized egg from attaching to the uterus. Washington State says all pharmacies must dispense the drug with no exemptions for religious or personal reasons. Rod Schaefer is the former CEO of the Washington State Pharmacy Association. He says he sat at the table with Planned Parenthood and NARAL to discuss the rule and the possible exemptions. I don't have the expertise to fill that particular prescription. Should I refer? Absolutely. I don't have the equipment. You know, all the business reasons, they would go, yes, yes, yes. And then you would say, but I have a conscious objection to this. And then we go, no. That was the only thing on the table that we said no. The Stormans and two other Washington pharmacists won their initial case against the state. Federal court found that what they were trying to do is to, quote, stamp out, end quote, religious objections to Plan B and to Ella. But the appeals court ruled against the Stormans, saying refusal to serve could lead the patient to feel shame. And... Speed is particularly important considering the time-sensitive nature of emergency contraception. This is the first time in America we have forced health care providers to participate in the taking of human life. Jason Calvi, EWTN News Nightly. Thank you, Jason. The Congressional Prayer Caucus accused the Supreme Court of doing great damage to religious freedom with its refusal to consider that case. We spoke with the co-chair of that caucus. Oklahoma Senator James Lankford co-chairs the Congressional Prayer Caucus, joining us now from the U.S. Capitol. Senator, you and other senators urge the Supreme Court to take up the Washington pharmacy case. I imagine you're disappointed that they won't hear it. I'm extremely disappointed. The Stormans case is one of those anchor cases, and what uh, uh, Justice Alito said, this is an ominous sign for religious liberty. It's a, a pretty basic thing to say that people should be able to live their rights of conscience, whether it's as an individual at home, whether at work, or whether at church. And what the Supreme Court, by refusing to take it up, basically allowed the Washington state law that specifically targeted people of faith uh, to say that the state's uh, emphasis is more important than your personal faith. And I adamantly disagree with that. Do you think it's possible to protect the religious liberty rights of the pharmacists as well as the customers? It, it is, actually, and there was an easy way to be able to do it. In this particular case, as you know well, uh, in 2007, Washington State basically said that every pharmacy uh, has to carry whatever they tell them they have to be able to carry and what could be prescribed back to them, with a few exceptions, one of them, for instance, being cost. If they couldn't make enough money on it, they didn't have to carry it, but they didn't give them an exemption based on faith except for an individual pharmacist. So if you come walking into a pharmacy like the Stormans and they said they have a religious belief that they shouldn't carry the morning after pill, uh, which is an abortion patient, but there are multiple other pharmacies in the area, they would allow them to refer. They said, we don't carry that, but here are other pharmacies within a two mile radius, which is not difficult for people. Within two miles, here are other pharmacies that do carry the morning after pill. We just don't carry it based on faith reasons. Senator, are we as Americans who want to live our faith in the public square facing discrimination? And what can you do about that? 
th this is one of the difficult issues of our day, uh, is that for whatever reason, the nation's becoming afraid of faith and of people of faith. They would say you can have faith, but you need to live your faith outside of the public square. You can practice faith at home. You can practice faith in your church, but don't take it to school. Don't take it to work. Don't take it out in the public area. Don't speak about faith. That is completely contrary to who we are as Americans. We do not have freedom of worship in America. We have the free exercise of religion. That means you can both have a faith and live your faith in a public setting. We need to be able to step up and to say people of faith cannot be prohibited from living their faith. This particular Washington state law said an individual pharmacist could say, hey, I have conscience, I don't sell plan B, but the pharmacy owner in the business itself didn't have rights of conscience. Well, that, that's absurd. Uh, you go back to the Hobby Lobby case uh, just two years ago, uh, where in Hobby Lobby case, they allowed the business owners to be able to live out their faith, and that was protected. But for whatever reason right now, the court stepped back and said, well, we're not going to speak to this issue at this point. We're going to leave it alone now in this new case. So it's completely conflicting with a case just from two years ago. That now in Washington state, you can't live your faith as a business owner, but in other uh, cases, uh, you can. Oklahoma Senator James Lankford, thanks for joining us tonight. We're glad to be able to join you. Coming up, Pope Francis takes his theme of mercy to Krakow for World Youth Day. And students turn bottle caps into prosthetic limbs for people suffering in Africa. Thanks for joining us this Friday evening for EWTN News Nightly's Summer Special. I'm Brian Patrick. Pope Francis's trip to Krakow, Poland in late July was his first, first visit to Eastern Europe. Throngs of young Catholics welcome him to World Youth Day. It's aimed at inspiring young people to live out their faith. Wyatt Goolsby covered the Pope's visit. Poland is rolling out the red carpet for Pope Francis. The Holy Father arrived in Krakow to great fanfare and a personal welcome from the Polish president, who called Francis a road sign in life for young people. Hundreds of thousands of pilgrims are expected to attend this year's World Youth Day. More than 180 countries will be represented. I think it's really important to, you know, come together as one and really, you know, feel how universal our faith really is and just to share, you know, the Word of God amongst each other and as peers and as teens especially and just get God's message, you know, truly in our hearts. World Youth Day was established in 1985 by Polish-born St. John Paul II. His desire was to inspire young people to deepen their faith and become witnesses in the world. While he is in the predominantly Catholic country, the Pope will pray at the death wall in Auschwitz, where Polish resistance fighters were executed, and at the cell of Franciscan friar St. Maximilian Kolbe. What was happening to, to Jewish people in the Second World War was so important, and for the Pope to come and acknowledge that, I think it's quite important. Um, for him to come and see firsthand what was going on, I think, is very important as well. Preparations are also underway in the city of Czestochowa, home of the famous shrine of the Black Madonna. Cardinal Stanislaw Jewish dedicated Tuesday's opening mass to victims of recent terrorist attacks, including Father Jacques Amel, killed in France. With Europe on high alert, security remains a concern. Wyatt Goolsby, EWTN News Nightly. Wyatt filed that report in late July, and as he mentioned, while in Poland, Pope Francis paid a solemn visit to the Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camps. The Holy Father prayed in silence. He gave no speech. He wrote two simple lines in the guest book, begging for God's mercy and forgiveness. More than a million people likely died in those camps under the Nazi regime, most of them Jews. After the Pope's visit to Auschwitz, Dr. Victoria Barnett of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum talked with us about it. How might we honor the memory of these thousands who gave their lives to oppose the Nazi regime? Yeah. I think their stories are often little told um, in terms of the civilian populations that rose up against the Nazis. And it's an important part of the history. It's something that links them um, to the broader resistance across Europe um, during that period. There weren't enough people like that, but their actions are all the more remarkable. And I think that understanding that aspect of the history is an important part of understanding the larger history of the Holocaust. We cannot forget, and Pope Francis certainly visiting yes. Auschwitz yeah. and Birkenau over the weekend, yeah. what impact does that have to remind people 
Yeah. I think his visit was quite remarkable. He met both with um, survivors of the Holocaust, Jewish survivors of Auschwitz, um, as well as some of the righteous of the nations, the Polish civilians who rescued or hid Jews. Um, and that act of reconciliation, if you will, his reaching out to both communities in that moment and visiting Auschwitz this time, I think, in a, in a different we live in different times. Um, his visit was quite different from that of his predecessors, John Paul II and Benedict. Uh, he didn't make a large public statement, but he went deeply into prayer and silent. obviously was silent. Um, and it shows, I think, the importance, the ongoing importance of um, memorializing the Holocaust and truly understanding what happened in places like Auschwitz. It was chilling for me. My own Jewish great-grandmother, mm -hmm may have died there or in another concentration camp. We last heard from her in Holland, her daughter did. So it's, it's really something that we cannot forget. And with the racial tensions and all kinds of tensions yeah. in this country, what can we learn from that that would help us now maybe? Hmm. Well, that's a large question. Um, I, I would put that in a larger perspective. You just showed some of the violence that's happening across Europe, the rise of right-wing groups, the rise of anti-Semitism, the rise of violence against people of all faiths, the terrible murder of the French priest, um, that we seem to be living in a time where there's a great deal more to polarize us and more acts of this kind of violence and racism. Um, the museum tries to get people to think about that. We show a very specific history, the persecution of the Jews and the rise of anti-Semitism, but that opens the door for people to think more in depth, I think, about these, these larger issues. And quickly, tell us about America and the Holocaust. We have a new exhibit, a temporary exhibit we're planning to open in 2018 on America and the Holocaust. One of the things we're doing right now is a crowdsourcing exercise across the United States. We're inviting especially high school and college students to look at their local papers. I personally would love to see people look at their parochial papers or religious publications to see what was being reported during that era. They're sending them to the museum. We're posting them online. We now have hundreds, perhaps a couple thousand stories from that era that really show what the Holocaust looked like from the perspective of the ordinary American during that time. We'll have you back to talk more about that. Dr. Victoria to... Barnett with the Holocaust Memorial Museum here in D.C. Thanks we very much. It. Thank you. And Pope Francis often speaks about reaching out to the marginalized. Students in Rome team up to do that, turning bottle caps into prosthetic limbs for patients in Africa. Mary Shovlin shares their story. <laughs> With simple bottle caps that we throw away every day, these students at Instituto Massimo are giving people in Africa a better future. We usually throw our caps in the bin and, um, and we don't use them again. Instead we can um, break them into many pieces and then um, melt them and make a wire like this. That wire is used to make limbs like these. Volunteers teach the 69 students who signed up. With their help, not only are they making prosthetics, these kids from 8 to 15 years old are also making the 3D printers themselves. This team of 20 uh, parents that are engineers, professors uh, from high school, university, that are technicians, but also doctors uh, who like to do this stuff. We have lots of volunteers so, who help uh, in order to do this course. By using crowdfunding, they created Crowd for Africa to get the word out. Even big corporations like Visa and Volkswagen jumped on board. We put our idea on the platform on internet and uh, um, we, we asked for uh, a small amount more of money, like 50 euros or 100 euros, to help us doing the project. And with a little help of everybody, we reached three times the goals that we needed. They began last year by making drones, which they were able to present to Pope Francis. Impressed by their efforts, the Holy Father challenged them to make their next project something that could help others. This year, they went back to the Vatican to show Pope Francis their new project and were able to capture this moment when he blessed the new prosthetic hand. The students are using their knowledge to give back. Some are even making toys with the 3D printers to send to Africa. And Patrick here was nice enough to use his to do a little bit of marketing for us. In Rome, Mary Shovlin, EWTN News Nightly. Up next, we sit down one-on-one -on -one with an Olympic athlete now competing in Rio. And is there biblical inspiration behind the World Games? We'll explain.
Thank you for joining us this evening for our EWTN News Nightly Summer Special. I'm Brian Patrick. Pope Francis's prayer intention for the month of August is that sports may bring friendly encounters and contribute to peace in the world. The 2016 Summer Olympics present that opportunity. The world's top athletes are now competing in Rio de Janeiro. Summer Olympic sports include archery, swimming, gymnastics, beach volleyball, and track and field. 554 athletes make up Team USA. Wyatt Goolsby sat down recently with three-time Olympic canoeer Casey Eichfeld before he left for Rio. How are you feeling, physically, <sighs> emotionally? I am feeling amazing. Uh, you know, it's, it's incredible to be one month out from my third Olympics. Uh, it has been such a journey, and it's incredible. I can't believe that time is flying so quickly. You know, there are concerns we've been covering about the Zika virus, security in Rio in general. What do you make of all of that, and how do you kind of go into it? Thinking yeah, about that? absolutely. So we, we hear a lot of the concerns, uh, and Team USA has given us all of their attention, making sure that we know that they are going to take care of all of that stuff so that we can be there to focus on what our job is, to be there to compete and to bring home gold for the United States. So this will be your third time competing in the U.S. Olympic team. Uh, what kind of mental perseverance do you need? I mean, uh, besides all the physical stuff. <laughs> mental perseverance or stubbornness? I'm not sure which <laughs> it is, but, uh, you know, it's, it's an incredible sport that I do, and it's, it's just been so much fun throughout the entire time. I can't imagine life without it right now, so I just, I just keep going with it and enjoying it all the way, and uh, and turns out I'm actually okay at it. So, <laughs> <laughs> and so you're a canoeer, and you partially credit some of your background with being able to dance so you're, for your success. Tell me about the physical aspect and, and how you prepare for that. Absolutely. So uh, I'm actually a classically trained ballet dancer from the ages of seven to fourteen, uh, and only stopped because it was starting to clash with my my uh, high level uh, training in, in canoeing. So. Uh, it was a really important part because it gave me a lot of flexibility and balance and strength that are, are highly required attributes uh, while out on the water. You know, being able to duck and weave and be flexible while maintaining balance on a very unstable whitewater surface, you know, it's, it, sure. it's a lot of challenge. And so that was a really, really big part of my training, something that I'm actually looking at pursuing again, just to kind of on a casual basis to maintain those things. So specify the difference for me here between canoeing and kayaking. So uh, a canoe... Uh, People typically think of a, a canoe at camp. Well, very similar. We're kneeling in the boat and we're using a canoe paddle, but our boats look a lot like a kayak in that it has a deck over it and we sit in the center cockpit and have a spray deck to keep the water out. And that's really the, the, the gist of it. You know, very similar looking. We just kneel in the boat and use a canoe paddle. For young boys and girls who dream of making it to the Olympics one day, what would be your advice you'd give them? The advice I'd give is find a sport that is fun to you because if you don't have fun, then it's hard to have passion for it. And then from there, if you're really enjoying it, you just have to have, or, you know, put in the hard work to be able to find the motivation to, to push through those hard days when maybe the training hurt a little bit or maybe you didn't have a great day training. If you can have fun with it and put in that hard work, then, you know, the sky's the limit. A little bit of fun, a little bit of hard work, and stubbornness, yes. Like a little, bit of, stubbornness. <laughs> a little bit of stubbornness. Very good. Casey Eichfeld with the U.S. Olympic team. Thanks for coming in and talking with us today. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. That's good advice for life there, Casey. Well, as athletes compete in Rio, a museum releases a 15-day reading program linking the Olympics with the Bible. The folks at the Museum of the Bible tell Lauren Ashburn the good book helped inspire the modern Olympic Games. Stephen Bickley is vice president of the Museum of the Bible. He joins us now from Oklahoma City. It's scheduled to open three blocks from the Capitol in November of next year. What is the Museum of the Bible? Uh, we're a new nonprofit that uh, is building a museum in D.C., and we're dedicated to one thing, and that's inviting all people to engage with the Bible, with its history, narrative, and impact. And I understand that you are going to release very soon a special Olympics-themed program. What is the program? This, there's a Bible Olympics connection? I never would have thought that. That's uh, the interesting stories that we get to tell, and that's why we're telling it. We've created uh, several products. We have uh, 15 different one-minute features on it, and we've rolled it into a 25-minute radio special. And it just talks about the connection of the Bible to the Olympics. And, for example, the modern Olympics uh, came out of a movement from some Catholic seminarians and uh, a movement called Muscular Christianity, and it was the predecessor to the modern Olympic Games. There are some Olympians that I've heard of, gymnast Shannon Miller, track star Lolo Jones, who say that they were inspired by the Bible. Will they be part of this museum or part of this uh, new reading and listening program? 
Yeah, that is one of the uh, stories we tell. I really like Shannon Miller's story. Uh, she would, uh, as doing her floor exercise, uh, she would get to the last path and be very exhausted. And she would remember a verse from 2 Samuel that would give her the energy, the courage, and the inspiration to stick her final landing. And obviously, uh, it has made her the most uh, decorated women's Olympian uh, gymnastic uh, ever. I know, and the opening ceremonies are tonight. How can people hear about this themed programming? Where can where can we go to, to listen to it? It's off our website at museumofthebible.org backslash Olympics. They can also find it on Version. It's under the reading plans of Version. Great. And is there a Catholic component to the Museum of the Bible? What would that be? Well, we invite all people to engage with the Bible, and we have great relationships with the Catholic Church. We've had two of our traveling museum exhibits there at the Vatican, and the Church uh, was very gracious and opened doors for us to exhibit in Cuba. And so we've gone and exhibited in Cuba twice, and we've exhibited once at a uh, seminar in Buenos Aires. How was that received? I spent some time in Cuba with the president earlier this year. Uh, it was great. The people there, uh, you know, they've been deprived of the Bible uh, for 100 years. And, of course, you can't deprive anyone. But uh, they were uh, fascinated and came out in droves, uh, many of them waiting hours in line uh, to learn more about the Bible. And let's hope that's the case here in 2017 when the Museum of the Bible opens in Washington, D.C. Stephen Bickley, thank you so much for joining us. It was my pleasure. That discussion from August 5th. Thank you for watching EWTN News Nightly Summer Special. For our News Nightly team, I'm Brian Patrick, and we're going to leave you tonight with stunning video of Rio's famed Copacabana as the Olympics continue through next week. Good night. God bless.